Hello, welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is the peripheral nervous system and spinal reflexes. Okay, so to talk about some bones of the day, I actually want to talk about the vertebral column because this is where our nerves are going to exit the central nervous system and enter the peripheral nervous system. So the vertebral column, you recall, is protecting the spinal cord and the cranium is protecting the brain. So now we're gonna get out into the body through all of these spinal nerves and cranial nerves. And so let's talk about these vertebrae so that we can kind of understand how those nerves are exiting. So as far as parts of a typical vertebra go. The body's the weight-bearing part. You've got this arch in the back that has these two components, the pedicles and the lamellae. Look at it in your book. The vertebral foramen is going to be the hole through which the spinal cord is passing. So this is the body. This is the vertebral arch. Uh, we've got transverse processes that are going to stick out in the kind of transverse direction or laterally. So transverse processes, spinous processes, this is the body, this is the vertebral foramen, and that's where the spinal cord is passing through. Now, what we see here is that we need to know superior and inferior articular processes. So to see those, we really have to get two vertebrae together and look at that. So here is the inferior articular process of this superior vertebra. And here's its superior articular process. Did I get that right? This is the superior articular process of this superior vertebra. This is its inferior articular process. So its inferior articular process is articulating with the superior articular process of the next vertebra. And there's its inferior articular process. Here are both transverse processes. And another important thing that we can see when we bring these two vertebrae together is the intervertebral foramen, or plural, intervertebral foramina. And those are the holes through which our spinal nerves are exiting. So you don't see one really, like, you, like just looking at this, you can't see one with just one vertebra, but when we bring two of them together, we can see the intervertebral foramen. And then what else do you need to know? Intervertebral discs, I can't see on this, but Kelly has them. So the intervertebral discs are what type of tissue? tripping all over stuff. That is a comprehensive question from chapter four. It's fibrocartilage. So these intervertebral discs are pads of fibrocartilage that we find between the bodies of the vertebrae. And what's the function of fibrocartilage? To resist compression, right? So these bodies have a lot of compressive force as they are like bearing the weight of your body hanging onto it. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Did we get everything that we need? Oh no, you gotta stand back over here and get rid of the glare. Where are you going, Kelly? Stage left? Okay. All right, so, <laughs> all right, those. Now, what do we need to know specifically? I shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't do a bone of the day because there's a lot, <clears throat> I mean, muscle of the day. <laughs> got a lot going on here in vertebral column. It's hard enough in a face-to-face glass. -face okay, so cervical vertebrae. These are the first seven vertebrae that we see in the vertebral column. And the first two are unique. They're called the atlas and the axis. And they are unique because they are allowing for the specific special movements of like flexion and extension and hyperextension of your head and lateral and medial rotation of your head. So if you look here, we see C1 or the atlas and that is going to articulate with the occipital bone here. So these are the occipital condyles and they are going to uh, articulate with our um, uh, superior articulating facets 
on C1. So if we look here, what do we need to know about C1? It's called the Atlas. Why? Well, you know, have you seen the like sculpture Atlas shrugged? He was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Your Atlas is carrying the weight of your head on your shoulders. Think about it that way. And so that's this one. And then the next one is axis and it's around this axis that Atlas is going to rotate to allow you to medially and laterally rotate your head. So some characteristics that we need to know about in general for everything but Atlas and axis, we have this bifid spinous process. What does that mean? Like uh, you can see like these two really like kind of bifid spinous processes, two little pokes out. They're not very good on Kelly. You're not being very helpful. Well, yeah. So the spinous processes, which are poking them back out this way, you should see two kind of like bi a bifurcation in it. That's a general feature. Um, do we have it on the other one? Let's see. Let's zoom in. Oh yeah, you can kind of see it here better. See that? This seems like a lab thing, not a lecture thing, but whatever, here we are. Phone of the day. No muscles today, so that's a great one. So bifid spinous processes. The thing about C1 is that it doesn't have a body, and that's because its body kind of gets stuck as this thing called the bend of the odontoid process on C2. Welcome to the bone of the day on my living room floor. Okay. So you can see it back there, the dens. Wah, wah. Or odontoid process. It looks like a tooth. And that is the body of the atlas that gets left off on the axis. It's right here. So this is so complex. <laughs> right there. So, and what we can see is that then the atlas sits on the axis like that and allows for medial and lateral rotation of the head. So that joint right there between those two vertebra allows for that. For the flexion and extension of your head, also known as nodding of the head, that is what's occurring at the joint between the occipital bone and the atlas. So for atlas, no body, no spinous process, uh, and there's no intervertebral foramen between C1 and C2, and that's because they're allowing for these really special movements, uh, that lateral and, rotate, and medial rotation of your head, or the shaking no of the head. Don't you tell me that on a test. We need to be specific. Okay, so for axis, C2, some characteristics. It's got this dens, or the odontoid process right here. Looks like a tooth. It's teaching class today. Maybe it's the assistant. I sure look like her. Okay, some other unique features about our cervical vertebrae is that they have these holes right here called transverse foramen or transverse foramina is more than one. And these are the only vertebrae that have these holes in their transverse processes. So if we look down here at our thoracic vertebrae, there's no hole there in the transverse process. Look down here at our lumbar vertebrae, no hole in the transverse process. So if you were to walk up to a lab practical station and just see something that looked like this, and I were to ask you what kind of vertebra it was, it's fair game. Come on, anteater. It looks like an anteater. Here it is, cervical vertebra right there. See anteater? So yeah, you could walk up and just see one of those and have to know that that's a cervical vertebra. I'm not gonna ask you which one it is unless it's C1 or C2. Those are very distinct and you need to be able to identify those. But all of the others, you could just know that they're cervical vertebra because they look like anteaters and they have those transverse foramen. Okay, thoracic vertebrae. The thing about our thoracic vertebrae is that they are the vertebrae that are articulating with our ribs. So on their transverse processes, they have these transverse costal facets that you can see right there. And um, can we see that right there? Yes, you can see those. Okay, so what else? Inferior costal facets on the body. So let's check that out. Costal, ribs. So, no, I can't really. 
You can't see the bodies very well there. So let's zoom in here. Sorry, right, Kelly, you're very useful for some things sometimes. When we get to the ribs, we'll look at it in more detail. Um, what else? Long spinous processes that point downward. That's another distinct feature of our thoracic vertebrae. So if you see here in the cervical vertebrae, they point more like uh, posteriorly. And then as you move down in your thoracic vertebrae, they point more inferiorly. Lumbar vertebrae are down here. We have five lumbar vertebrae. These uh, spinous processes are hatchet shaped. A really distinct feature of the lumbar vertebrae is that they have really big weight bearing bodies. Um, and they look like mooses, I've heard. I've been told. So does that look like a moose? Can you see a moose in this vertebra? Uh, use your imagination, maybe. Well, what did the thoracic one look like? It would look like a, gi a giraffe. It did. Here, let's check it out. Giraffe, totally. See it? Giraffe with those knobby things on their head. I knew at one point what those knobby things were called. Not today. Lumbar vertebra looks like a moose. It's got a big, huge, weight-bearing body. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for that. Sacrum. This is five fused vertebrae that we see here. And then the coccyx is down here. And this is three to five fused vertebrae. Uh, so there's some variability. We seem to be evolving them out as we no longer wag tails or anything like that. So that is your vertebral column. And that makes up the bone of the day. I wasn't gonna do a muscle of the day. But I have to meditate. That seems like really stressful. So much easier in class to do bones of the day and all of it. All right. Thank you, Alex, for all of your assistance. Thank you, Kelly, for all of your assistance. <sighs> muscles in the leg that are going to oppose the actions of the muscles that we learned yesterday for you. I mean, yeah, I was here yesterday. Um, I was here moments ago without a hat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on your leg, we have these two muscles that people think of as like your calf muscles. Your gastrocnemius here, deep to it is soleus. And then just to get out of the leg, like all the muscles that you need to know in the leg, might as well do peroneus longus or fibularis longus over here. And then that's everything you need to know in the leg. You still need to know some more muscles in the thigh and in the hip, but we'll continue working on that. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you just have to learn them all when we get to muscles. All right, I digress. Muscle of the day, gastrocnemius. So muscles always pull, they never push. So when this muscle contracts or shortens, it's gonna pull on this tendon here called the calcaneal tendon. Why is it the calcaneal tendon? Well, that's the calcaneus. You learned that last time. And a tendon attaches bone to muscle or muscle to bone. So when we contract, we're gonna grab this calcaneal tendon and point your toes or plantar flex your foot. So this is the plantar surface of your foot. And when you contract your gastrocnemius and your soleus muscles, you plantar flex your foot. So out here we can see gastrocnemius and it's this double bellied kind of muscle here. And if we pull off one of these bellies, we can see the other big plantar flexor, our soleus muscle. Soleus looks like a fish and it's down here. So this is soleus. This is soleus. Soleus is deep to gastrocnemius and it also contracts, shortens, and pulls on the calcaneal tendon to plantar flex your foot. Uh, peroneus longus or fibularis longus uh, is this one. So either one works, but your fibula is under there, right? Mm hmm sure is. So this is your fibularis longus. And this one helps with some plantar flexion, but the other cool thing that it does is it everts your foot. So if you recall, last time we talked about inversion being when you contract and take the plantar surface of your foot and bring it toward the medial surface of your body. What muscle did that? I'm gonna let you think on it. 
And eversion is the opposite. When you take the plantar surface of your foot and move it to the medial, the lateral surface of your body. So you evert it or put it to the exterior. And when you do that, the, muscles that's gonna, the muscle that's going to pull is this one. And what it's going to do is it's going to wrap around. It's really cool. And insert under here and grab and go and evert your foot. So that's what Peronius longus does. So they're all three plantar flexors, but Peronius longus has the additional job of coming through here, grabbing onto your uh, metatarsal here, like it grabs on here and pulls it. It's pretty awesome. I recommend looking at origins and insertions. Just saying, people. Okay, so your origins and your insertions, if your origins and your insertions are going to really help you understand what a muscle is doing to a bone. Because if we know that they always pull, they never push. And we can see how this muscle wraps around under the foot and grabs it on the inside. When it pulls, it's gonna pull your foot to the outside. What? Just blew my own mind. No, I didn't. A while ago I did about that. I was just like, man, you know, I love the muscles. Here we go, muscle meditation. Okay, close your eyes. Breathe in, gastrocnemius. And breathe out, plantar flexus foot. And breathe in, gastrocnemius. And breathe out, plantar flexus foot. And breathe in, soleus and breathe out, plantar flexus foot. And breathe in, soleus, and breathe out, plantar flexus foot. So let's begin by talking about some questions to kind of get your brains warmed up. So for general sensory information, to reach the cerebrum, it must travel through A, ascending pathways, B, Interneurons, C, the diencephalon, D, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is all of the above. So why is that the case? Let's think about this. General sensory information. It's got to get all the way to the cerebrum. So it's going to ascend the spinal cord using an interneuron to do so. That interneuron is going to synapse in the diencephalon, which part is the, um, the sensory relay station? The thalamus, right? So then from the thalamus, we'll shoot up to uh, the primary somatosensory cortex. Where's that? Postcentral gyrus of your parietal lobe. All right. Okay, next question. Sensory neurons can be found in blank roots before they merge with motor neurons and spinal nerves. You might say we haven't talked about spinal nerves yet. We haven't really, but we talked about how we could see the arrangement of our sensory and motor neurons in our spinal cord. And so I guess maybe I didn't explicitly say it, but you've got to be able to bring multiple things together in anatomy and physiology. So if back here we have our dorsal horns, and we know that that's dorsal because we did, I definitely pointed this out, that we've got our dorsal root ganglion right here. So that's where the somas of our unipolar sensory neurons are. Well, this is the dorsal root ganglion. So this is the dorsal root. So sensory neurons are found in the dorsal root, and then they're gonna merge with our motor neurons, which are found in the ventral root, to form a spinal nerve. We're gonna talk about nerves today, and their classification. So uh, just we'll, th that's how we can kind of bring it all together. So the answer is dorsal. Sensory neurons can be found in dorsal roots before they merge with motor neurons in spinal nerves. So neurons 
axons of neurons run in nerves in the PNS, and that's what we're talking about today. So we'll get there. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have some things that we need to consider. Our sensory receptors and what type of stimuli they're responding to. We're going to talk about the different types of nerves that we have, where we've got these axons of neurons running together in the PNS, and so the different types of nerves. Um, we'll talk a little bit about motor endings and activity, just so that you know what how it relates to the PNS. We'll talk a lot about this when we get to the specific effectors of our motor neurons. Uh, and we are going to spend a lot of time talking about reflex activity. So in a normal semester, we'd probably split this lecture and end like here. So if you need to take a break, you know, before you get to reflex activity, do it. Do whatever you got to do. We just have to get through this material before your next exam. Okay. So receptors, our sensory receptors. What do receptors do? They detect changes in stimuli, right? So we're going to classify our receptors a couple ways. We're going to classify them based on what type of stimulus they're responding to, or the modality of stimulus. Or we can look at the body location, not of the receptor, but of the stimulus. Is the, the stimulus coming from outside the body? Is it an external stimulus? Or is the stimulus coming from inside the body? Is it an internal stimulus? And then the last way that we'll talk about our receptors is uh, classify them based on their structural complexity. We'll see that all of our special sensory receptors are part of special sense organs. So really we're going to talk about our simple receptors um, at the end of lecture so that we can, yeah, be done with the peripheral nervous system. So first way that we talk about our receptors is what type of stimuli are they responding to? So the way that we classify our receptors by stimulus type is another way that we say this, and I tend to use this word, receptors by modality of stimulus um, or the type, the mode that it's being activated by. So mechanoreceptors are receptors that are going to be activated in response to some kind of physical perturbation. So you actually move a receptor, a mechanoreceptor, and that's going to result in it generating a potential that will transmit to our sensory neuron. So mechanoreceptors, these respond to physical stimuli or physical perturbation. Perturbation, that's like disruption or uh, being disturbed. So mechanoreceptors respond to physical perturbation. So what's an example of that? Well, like vibration or like soft touch. Those are mechanoreceptors. So for example, being able to feel like pressure, touch, vibration, stretch, all that's going to be activating a mechanoreceptor by modality of stimulus. Okay? All right. So the next type of modality we have or type of stimulus that we can respond to is changes in temperature. And those are going to be detected by thermoreceptors. So, and we've got two types of thermoreceptors. Cold thermoreceptors that respond to temperatures below 98.6 degrees and hot thermoreceptors that are sensitive to temperatures above 98.6 degrees. So these respond to temperature changes. And we've got two types, hot, which are going to be sensitive to higher than 98.6 degrees, and cold, which are sensitive to less than 98.6 degrees. And where would we find these? Where do you feel hot and cold? In your skin, right? Your brain, your thermoregulatory center of your brain, which is what? The hypothalamus is also paying attention to temperature, so it's got thermoreceptors there as well. But um, yeah, we'll say, uh, for example, those in your skin or your hypothalamus, 
those are really the only places that you are feeling temperature changes or you're responding to temperature changes. You're not really aware of the temperature changes that your hypothalamus is detecting and that's because this is part of the diencephalon. The information that the hypothalamus is paying attention to is below your cerebrum. For you to be conscious of it, we've got to get it all the way to the cerebrum so your thermoreceptors in your skin are going to be able to communicate information to long sensory neurons that will go up an ascending pathway and end where? It's a general sense, so it'll be the postcentral gyrus of your parietal lobe. All right. Next, for modality of stimulus, we have photoreceptors. And photoreceptors are responding to photons of light. So where might we find those? In our eyeball, and that's the only place. So photoreceptors respond to photons of light. And we find them in the eye, uh, specifically in the retina. They're called rods and cones. And so we'll just kind of put that in our back pocket. That these are in our retina. These rods and cones, and they're responding to photons of light. Great. Next, chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors are responding to chemicals suspended in fluid. So that's really important. You can't just dump a chemical on my skin and if I don't suspend it in fluid, it's not gonna activate anything. So chemoreceptors that you're aware of are like the chemoreceptors that are activated for your sense of olfaction or your sense of smell. So odorants get suspended in mucus in your nasal cavity and get up there to the olfactory epithelium and you can smell that. Uh, chemoreceptors on your tongue are going to be activated when tastants are suspended in saliva. Chemoreceptors in your gut are going to be activated when whatever's passing through your gut is uh, mixed with our di various um, mucus and digestive secretions. So chemoreceptors are responding to chemicals suspended in fluid. All right, so we could say, for example, in your nose, your taste buds, well, it's not your nose, it's in your nasal cavity, your taste buds on your tongue, or like your small intestine has chemoreceptors that are sensing like lipid concentration in the material that's coming through. Uh, we'll talk more about that next semester with the digestive system. Nociceptors are our last type of receptor by modality of stimulus. So nociceptors are very specifically responding to painful stimuli. And painful stimuli are indicative of tissue damage. So when you activate a nociceptor, you're going to activate a reflex to move away from that painful stimulus so that you don't damage your tissue. So nociceptors respond to painful stimuli. And what we could say about painful stimuli is that this is indicative of tissue damage. So tissues are going to start suffering if you're feeling pain. All right, so what's an example of pain? Well, I don't know if you've ever had somebody pinch you and like twist your skin. That hurts and you're going to get a bruise. Uh, what other types of receptors might we be activating before we get to the point of activating those nociceptors in that case? Mechanoreceptors. So I would activate a pressure receptor for sure. Another time you might feel pain if you touch something hot, that's going to hurt. So there I'm activating a thermoreceptor and a nociceptor. If you get inflammation and you start having an excess um, buildup of fluid, it's going to start pushing on nociceptors and you're going to feel pain. So nociceptors are responding to painful stimuli. That's the first way that we classify our receptors. So the next type of classification system we use for our receptors is location. So where is the 
stimulus coming from? And we do this three ways. We've got three types of receptor classification by location. And the first is the exteroceptors are those receptors that are responding to external stimuli. So if we look back at this list, we have examples of mechanoreceptors that are responding to external stimuli. Thermoreceptors are responding to ex external stimuli. In the case of like, if it's hot outside, that's external. Photoreceptors, this one throws people off because sometimes people say those are interoceptors. And maybe they feel like they're interoceptors because they're at the back of your eyeball. Photons of light are not from inside your body, people. Photons of light are from all around in the environment. So photoreceptors are also exteroceptors. Chemoreceptors can be extero or interoceptors. Mechanoreceptors can be interoceptors. You can have a level of stretch in an organ, that's a mechanoreceptor. Thermoreceptors can be intero, extero. Photoreceptors are really only extero. Chemo, intero, extero. Nociceptors. Where's pain coming from? That's kind of interesting. Uh, outside of you, but like, mm, also it could be from inside of you. So like proprioceptors are found in your joints and those um, can be responding to pain in your joints. So as with everything, we've got multiple ways of classifying it and you have to be aware of the ways that those classification systems overlap. So exteroceptors by definition respond to stimuli from the external environment or external stimuli. For example, we could say photons, we could say uh, odorants, mm, pressure, like this is external, you know. Lots of examples, you're gonna look them over, I'm sure. Interoceptors are responding to internal stimuli. So that example of a chemoreceptor in your small intestine detecting change of lipid concentration. That's a chemoreceptor that's an interoceptor because what it's responding to is a change inside your body, in the internal environment of your body. So interoceptors respond to internal stimuli. So for example, um, in the small intestine, it's checking like, I don't know, the pH, sure, of your chyme, or the lipid concentration. You've got chemoreceptors that are detecting the pH of your blood. Um, lipid concentration in your meal. So yeah, all that jazz, what else? Um, and another example like of an interoreceptor that would be a mechanoreceptor. You've got these pressure receptors, baroreceptors that are detecting level of stretch and we can find those in like your aortic arch so that we're detecting level of blood pressure. Uh, we've got stretch receptors, baroreceptors in your kidney. So um, that would be an example of an interoreceptor that is a mechanoreceptor. So be aware of that. The last type is kind of weird. Proprioceptors are specifically found in like your joints and joint capsules. And what they are doing is they're responding to like limb position and place in space. You also have some in your ear in the vestibular complex. It helps you to be aware of head position. So those are considered proprioceptors because they're allowing you to know of your place in space. So proprioceptors we find in joints, um, muscles, like in joint capsules. You can also find nociceptors in joint capsules. Uh, joints, muscles, joint capsules. And they're responding to limb position. So this tells you about your place in space. I guess I should say limb or body position. So place in space. So when we talked about the function of the cerebellum as being important for comparing input to output, proprioceptors, a lot of their information is shooting up to the cerebellum and going straight back to the cerebellum and you're just like not even aware of it. And that's because your cerebellum is paying attention and seeing if where your limbs are 
because of the information coming from proprioceptors is where your limbs want to be because it's also comparing your motor output that's coming down, which is really cool. That's what's really cool about the cerebellum. So let's just geek out on that for a moment. We'll call it a brain break where we can review something that we talked about in our last chapter, because this is how we're trying to bring it all together. Chapter 13 matters because it's out in the body and it's bringing us up to chapter 12. So um, if, if you imagine that we're going to initiate some motor command from our precentral gyrus here, those commands are coming down through projection fibers and they're coming down through your brainstem. Some of those fibers, some fibers are projecting back to the cerebellum. So your cerebellum says, okay, this is what we want to be doing. Doing. And then in the ascending pathway coming up the spinal cord, we have information coming from proprioceptors in our limbs and joints, and it's shooting back to the cerebellum. And it's saying, okay, this is what, uh, this is what I am doing. So this is what I want to be doing. This is what I am doing. Do those two match up? If they do, good, good job, good to go. If they don't, then the cerebellum makes the adjustments that allow the two to match up. And that again is what gets, um, uh, affected first by alcohol and what they're testing the effectiveness, uh, the uh, efficacy of when they're doing a roadside sobriety test. Okay, that is how we discuss our receptors by stimulus location. The next way that we talk about our receptors is by complexity and they're either going to be simple, we've got two types of simple, category, two categories of simple, like nine types, I think, uh, non-encapsulated and encapsulated. And then we've got sense organs that are complex. So we'll talk more about those in chapter 15. What we're going to talk about right now are our simple, in, in great detail right now, are our simple receptors. And I don't want you to forget simple receptors. I want you to memorize the chart of simple receptors. The reason that we're doing this now in the class in this order is because these simple receptors that you're going to be looking at are, say, here in your skin. And so if I first taught you about the skin and was like, oh, you've got bulbous corpuscles and, you know, Pacinian corpuscles. You'd be like, what the heck is that and why do I care? You wouldn't care if we were talking about the skin, but since we're talking about the nervous system, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna tell you that these are located in the skin and they're responding to light pressure or deep vibration. Then now, when we get to the skin and I talk about it again, you're gonna be like, oh, I learned this in your mind. You'll be able to think it through the first order sensory neuron that's bringing it into our second order inner neuron that's bringing it to our third order inner neuron in the thalamus that's bringing it to our post central gyrus so by doing it this way maybe backwards if you will i don't think it's backwards we're really getting like you know a full picture of what's going on how does this relate all of this information that's starting out down here in these receptors is going to wind up here on the postcentral gyrus, on that homunculus that's the map of your body, the sensory map of your body. So that's why we're talking about it now, and I want you to know this stuff now because then it'll just make a lot more sense later. Okay, so simple receptors come in two flavors. Simple receptors are going to be for our general senses, and they come in a non-encapsulated form and an encapsulated form. And all this means, the non-encapsulated, is that they do not have a connective tissue sheath around them. And this is going to allow them to be really sensitive to particular types of stimuli. So we'll talk about these in a minute, and we'll talk about those in uh, greater detail after we get through these. But simple receptors are for the general senses. What are the general senses? Everything other than the special senses. What are the special senses? Sight, smell, taste, and hearing, uh, and equilibrium. So. Uh, yeah, so everything that's not that, your sensation of temperature, your sensation of pressure, all the rest of it is general, and those are using simple receptors. Now, non-encapsulated receptors do not have a connective tissue sheath around them, which allows them to be, they are pretty sensitive to very light stimuli. 
so, or very important stimuli. We've got three examples of non-encapsulated sensory receptors. The first is just a free nerve ending. But we're going to call it the receptor because it's the receptive end of this sensory neuron. So this free nerve ending would be the sensory receptive kind of area. And then um, it would be coming uh, on the peripheral extension of the axon of a unipolar sensor neuron, sensory neuron that then is synapsing in our spinal cord, the central process going synapsing on the spinal cord. Now, free nerve endings are going to be super sensitive to particular stimuli. And so we can find these as nociceptors because we really want to be sensitive to painful stimuli. If something hurts, we need to get away from that pretty immediately. Thermoreceptors also, if something is super hot, you need to be able to feel that and move away immediately. So nociceptors, thermoreceptors, are some good examples. Now that's by method of um, modality of stimulus. Chemoreceptors are free nerve endings and some mechanoreceptors for very light touch. Okay, and so we can actually find, so that would be like the different types of modality we have or uh, stimulus type. Then as far as location of stimulus, we can find free nerve endings as interoreceptors, exteroreceptors, and some proprioceptors. So have a look in your book and um, come up with your comprehensive list of all of the specific locations. How about, what's our next type? Our next type of non-encapsulated um, receptor is a hair root plexus. And these are associated with hair roots, as it might sound. And why would we want to have a free nerve ending associated with a hair root? Well, because if your hair moves, then there might be something there that you need to like get away, like a, an insect or something. So a hair root plexus is a free, root, a free nerve ending that is um, going to be associated with a hair root and it detects hair deflection. So this detects hair deflection. Okay, so what do you think this is by modality of stimulus? It's a mechanoreceptor. Hair deflection is a physical event. What do you think this is by location of stimulus? Exteroreceptor. You don't have any uh, hairs inside your body, so it's a mechanoreceptor, not unless you're growing like you have one of those like twins inside you that has hairs. I guess then you could have hairs inside your body. But I don't know if you, you're not responding to it. Your weird twin is. Okay, so it's a mechanoreceptor. It's an exteroreceptor. And we find it where? Around a hair root. Okay, our last type of free nerve ending is associated with, it's a modified free nerve ending. It's associated with a tactile cell in your epidermis. So a modified free nerve ending or a tactile disc. Um, and what this is, if you look, if you zoom in to the dermis of the skin, we've got this areolar connective tissue that forms this papillary layer. And right here on the basal layer of our epidermis, we have these sensory receptor cells called tactile cells. That's not, it's, that's not the free nerve ending. The free nerve ending is coming up and forming this tactile uh, complex with that cell in the epidermis. So it's sensitive to very light touch. Tactile discs are mechanical receptors. They are exteroceptors and they're responding to very light touch or very, yeah, so very, very sensitive to low levels of stimulation. So for our non, so for our encapsulated receptors, we have six types. First, let's go over the three that we can find in the skin. They're found in other places as well. Uh, and then we'll talk about the ones that we find as proprioceptors. So tactile corpuscles are these little receptors that you see here that are poking up into this papillary layer of the dermis and are contacting your epidermis. So their location should let you know that they're responding to very light 
levels of vibration, low frequency vibration and light touch because they're just right up there associated with the um, epidermis. So they're not feeling things or not responding to things that are kind of lower down. So tactile corpuscles uh, respond to low frequency vibration and light touch. Okay, so what type is that by modality of stimulus? It's a mechanoreceptor, right? Okay, so it's mechano. Now, these are found really only here in the dermis of your skin. So where's the uh, location of the stimuli? Exteroceptors. All right, good deal. Now, our next, I think these are also called Meisner's corpuscles. We're trying to get away from dead scientist names. Lamellar corpuscles are the next. And lamellar corpuscles are these guys that we find down here, sometimes in the dermis, but sometimes also in the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. So they're responding to uh, deeper levels of pressure um, and higher uh, frequency of vibration. So our lamellar corpuscles respond to deep pressure and vibration. So these guys we really find um, as detecting those things in the skin and um, then also as some proprioceptors. So um, and actually you can find these as some um, interoceptors as well. So for modality of stimulus for our lamellar corpuscle, they um, can be intero, extero, or proprioceptors. And they are um, mechanoreceptors. Okay, then our last type of um, corpuscle that we'll find in the skin is this bulbous corpuscle here. And again, this is deep in the dermis. Um, we also find these as some proprioceptors. So um, we can find them as exteroceptors and proprioceptors, and they're responding to uh, also this deeper pressure and um, deep vibration. So our bulbous corpuscles, Respond to vibration and pressure. We find them in the dermis uh, as exteroceptors, and we find them in some joints as proprioceptors. So, what's our modality of stimulus? They're mechanoreceptors. Okay, so that's half of our non encapsulate, or sorry. <laughs> That's half of our encapsulated uh, simple receptors. Okay, so our last three types of simple receptors that are encapsulated are all proprioceptors. We're actually gonna talk about reflexes that are activated when these two receptors detect their stimuli at the end of our lecture. Uh, but let's just talk about them as our introduction to receptors. The first are called muscle spindles, and we find muscle spindles in muscles. And what they're responding to is level of muscle stretch. So if you're overstretching a muscle and could cause damage, that's going to activate a muscle spindle. So what type of stimulus do you think that is? It's mechano. These are mechanoreceptors. And do you think that's external or internal? We can find these as extero, as these are, those are, I'm um, sorry, <laughs> these are proprioceptors, right? So it's internal to the muscle that we're detecting this stretch. So our muscle spindles detect muscle stretch. They, that's a mechanoreceptor and it's a proprioceptor. All right, our tendon organs are detecting level of tendon stretch. So our tendons are attaching our muscles to our bones. So if this is stretching, what is this muscle doing? 
it's shortening. So if my muscle is shortening and pulling on this tendon, then I run the risk of popping the muscle off the bone, so I'll activate a reflex and cause this muscle to stop contracting. Talk about that in a minute, but this is a proprioceptor that we find in the tendons, and it's detecting level of tendon stretch. which is indicative of muscle shortening, which is muscle contraction, or muscle tension. So if you're asking your muscle to do too much, you're gonna activate a tendon organ. It detects tendon stretch, it's a proprioceptor, it's a mechanoreceptor, and a proprioceptor, and a simple encapsulated receptor, okay? Joint kinesthetic receptors are found in joint capsules. They're mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors. So they're responding to, they're helping detect limb position or your place in space. So they're in joint capsules and uh, they're proprioceptors that are helping to detect place in space. Okay, the other way that we can classify our receptors by complexity is that they're not simple. They're complex, and they're found as part of special sense organs. So we'll talk about the sense organs when we get there. Um, next, this is kind of something important to be aware of, that just because there's a sensation of something doesn't mean that you have a perception of something, and just because you're having a sensation doesn't mean that you're gonna perceive it the same as somebody else who is receiving the same sensation. What the heck am I talking about? So sensation is the ability to respond to a stimulus. So your receptors are sensing and experiencing sensations all the time. The only way you perceive those sensations is if they make it all the way up to your cerebrum. And then perception is different for every person. So your ability to have sensations or awareness of changes is critical, but your perception of that sensation is also really important. Your perception is how you interpret those sensations. So for example, if you eat a berry, then it gives you these sensations that like, your tongue is just like and you perceive that as like bitter or something, then you won't eat it and then you don't get poisoned. Does that kind of make sense? So sensation is your awareness of a change and perception is your interpretation of that. So your interpretation of the sensation. So there are lots of weird examples, but like uh, cilantro is a great example, I think, of a sensation that leads to different perceptions. If I smell cilantro, these sensations, my awareness of cilantro odorants going into the air goes through the roof. And my perception of it, my interpretation of that is so strangely like euphoric that if I'm like on the other end of the produce aisle and the sprinklers come on and make that cilantro wet and I smell it, I actually have to turn around and go get cilantro. Like it makes my brain feel all fuzzy and great. When my mom was dying on the way to visit her, we had to stop and get cilantro because my perception of it is just that it's like amazing, I don't know. My daughter, who came out of my body and is half of my genetic information, smells cilantro and she thinks it smells disgusting. So she has the awareness of the change of cilantro odorants in the, in the air, but her perception of it is that it's gross. So that's, it's really kind of just interesting. Perceptions are totally dependent on, on you. And what's really interesting also is that you can have like varying, very different perceptions of something like pain. So like I had a friend who anytime she had big, some big massive life event, she had to go get tattooed for tattoo therapy because the pain of it was therapeutic for her somehow. I don't much like pain. I mean, I like tattoos, so I'll scream my way through it, but I don't get them for therapy. So yeah, just something kind of interesting to be aware of, put in your back pocket. All right, nerves are our big organs of the peripheral nervous system. And we're gonna think about them in a couple ways. First of all, what is their structure? Well, what's running in nerves? 
axons of neurons, right? So if we've got a whole bunch of neurons, or axons of neurons running together, like right next to each other, sure, they're myelinated. So here we go, this is three neurons. But if they're right next to each other, and there's a voltage change here, what's to say then that this voltage change here isn't gonna stimulate the voltage gated channels on this neuron to open and then now I get all weird signaling because I was trying to shoot an action potential down this neuron, but it got, it, you know, stimulated this neuron. That doesn't happen because each of our neurons is insulated, so this would be totally covered, in a sheath of connective tissue called endoneurium. So this one I'll color in because it's surrounding and encasing the neuron. This one will have a cross section. And this innermost layer of connective tissue that's insulating individual neurons is called endoneurium. Endo, within. Neurium, the nervous tissue in our neuron. So endoneurium is going to electrically insulate each axon from the next axon. So this electrically insulates axons and Every axon is surrounded in endoneurium. So within our nerve, every axon is surrounded by endoneurium. So endoneurium surrounds axons in nerves. Okay, so then we get a whole bunch of these neurons clumped together in a larger structure within the nerve called a fascicle. And so in our fascicle, we would see we've got all these neurons running together, but there's a fascicle here and here's a fascicle here because this is a big, long, huge nerve. So our fascicles are little groups of neurons within the nerve that are then also encased in their own kind of connective tissue. But now this is going to be perineurium or around like our fascicle. So in here our fascicles are surrounded in perineurium and a fascicle is a group of neurons within the nerve, a smaller grouping of neurons and it's surrounded by perineurium. Peri, around, neurons, neurium. Okay, so our fascicles of neurons then are surrounded in perineurium. Now this is dense irregular connective tissue. What does dense irregular connective tissue do? It resists stretch in multiple directions, right? So this is going to allow our nerve to move if it has to. Okay, um, perineurium is dense irregular connective tissue. All right, so then you get a whole bunch of fascicles together in one nerve, and the entire nerve is surrounded by epineurium. So like my connective tissue sheath, it's like they're, they're cylindrical structures. So out here, this is epineurium, epi upon, neurium upon the nerve, our nervous tissue. So nerves are the organs of the peripheral nervous system. They're surrounded by epineurium. And this is also dense, irregular connective tissue so that we can resist stretch in multiple directions. Now this connective tissue totally encases your neurons. So, and your immune system sees connective tissue all the time. So as long as you've got a nerve intact, everything's good. But if you get nerve damage and rupture through this uh, dense irregular connective tissue in the epineurium and rupture through this dense irregular connective tissue of the perineurium and rupture through this aerial or connective tissue of the endoneurium, this is the first time your immune system has seen a neuron and it will start attacking that cell 
because it thinks it's foreign. So yeah, that's a whole different class, a whole another topic. Fascinating. Nerve damage is quite interesting. Uh, but yeah, that's what the structure of a nerve looks like. Now let's talk about how we classify them. All right, so now when we look at the neurons that are running in nerves, we can determine what kind of nerves they are. If you have a nerve that has only sensory neurons running in it, it's a sensory nerve. If you have a neuron that has only motor neurons running in it, it's a motor nerve. If you have a, neuron, a, a nerve that has both sensory and motor neurons running in it, it's a mixed nerve, okay? So we classify our nerves based on what type of information they're carrying. So classification based on type of neurons present. So sensory nerves have only sensory neurons, which means that they are responding to a receptor and conducting that information right back to our central nervous system. So sensory nerves have neurons that are conducting only sensory information. So these contain only sensory neurons. Motor nerves have o neurons that are only conducting efferent commands away from the central nervous system. So motor nerves contain only motor neurons. And then mixed nerves have both sensory and motor neurons in them. So we've got information being conducted afferently and efferently through neurons in the same nerve not through the same neuron, through neurons in the same nerve. So mixed nerves contain both sensory and motor neurons. Okay. All right. Now, the other way that we're going to classify our nerves is based on where they are arising from, where the somas of the neurons can be found. Are they arising in the brain or brain stem up in the head? If so, they're a cranial nerve. Are they arising from the spinal cord? If so, they're a spinal nerve. So. I'll just tell you right now, our cranial nerves are the only ones that are going to be able to be sensory or motor. All of the spinal nerves are mixed. All spinal nerves conduct both sensory and motor information. Our cranial nerves can be one or the other. And we're gonna learn a couple mnemonics to memorize these cranial nerves. The first is ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Aha! <laughs> so that's the one my instructor taught me and that I still remember to this day. You can find some X-rated ones and R-rated ones online. I can't tell you about that. Gotta keep it PC around here. So this is gonna how you're, how you're going to remember the names. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal. So that's the first mnemonic. The second mnemonic you're going to remember is some say marry money. But my brother says big brains matter more. Again, you can find other things that may matter more <laughs> that might be R or X rated. Go look it up online. What this is telling you is what kind of nerve we have. What? We don't have any 
B nerves. No, we don't. We have mixed nerves. But you can't tell the M in mixed apart from the M in motor. So in order to give you a mnemonic that's going to help you, I have to tell you that the trigeminal nerve has both sensory and motor neurons in it. Now, if I were to give you something on a quiz or an exam that was like a list of nerves and asked you to tell me if they, like, tell me are what type of nerve they are, if you ever said trigeminal is a both nerve, you would be wrong. Trigeminal is a mixed nerve that carries both motor and sensory information. All right. Now let's talk about what each of these nerves are doing, our cranial nerves. Cranial nerves you have to memorize and be able to identify on models, and maybe some of them on the sheep brain. So you're going to have to do that for your lab, and so make sure that you look at lab guide 8 for cranial nerves. And okay, olfactory. This is a sensory neuron. We said olfaction was the sense of smell, so it might be sensory for the sense of smell. All right, optic, sensory, optic, eyes, sense of vision, oculomotor, oculo, eyes, motor, motor neuron. This is giving you motor output to the eye. And there are extrinsic eye muscles that pull on the eyes to move them in different directions. That's what the motor output is going to. I'm not going to make you memorize which muscle for each of the ones that are controlling motor output to the eye, but just be aware, oculomotor is putting motor output to the eye. So motor to the eye. Why? So I can move it all around. Okay. Trochlear is also motor to the eye. Motor eye. Trigeminal, I really like. Okay, so I'm going to give you some ways to remember like our two T's versus our two V's. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that we discussed this because it brings up the fact that I forgot to mention these can all be numeraled. Every cranial nerve can be substituted by its numeral. So CN1, CN cranial nerve 2, 3. Now if I were to ask you to give me the numerals and classification of all of my cranial nerves and you were to do something like write 1, 2, 3, well then you'd be wrong because it's not 1, 2, 3, it's I, 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 I. Okay? So that's another, success, or, uh, another acceptable way to name your cranial nerves is actually using their um, numeral. So I'm actually going to write them down because this is going to help us remember a couple of them. So, okay. Uh, because we've got two T's and we've got two V's. So how am I going to know my very from my velvet? or my two from my touch. My trochlear number four is motor to the eye. Not very interesting. I like things to be like even, like fives, tens, or V's and X's. So trigeminal nerve actually is also cool. It's got its numeral in its shape. Trigeminal has three kind of ways that it's gonna terminate and come out and contact your face. So trigeminal is a mixed nerve, and it helps with sensory input from the face and motor output to the face. So it's a mixed nerve, and how I'm going to remember that trigeminal is number five hoo -hoo, is because it does that. Hoo -hoo, hoo -hoo, number five. Okay, trigeminal is number five. The other cool thing about it is, if you have herpes simplex virus and you get cold sores, it's living in your trigeminal nerve. So it's hiding out in the soma up there, back there, and then you get stress. Like, oh crap, here comes my AMP test too. And that lady, she's a hard teacher. So you're studying and you're studying and you're studying and all of a sudden, you get a cold sore. Why did that happen? Because the herpes virus that was sitting up uh, like dormant in your trigeminal nerve was like, oh crap, my host is gonna die. And so it goes into its lytic cycle and travels down your trigeminal nerve and ruptures on your face. So just something to be aware of. Maybe that'll help you remember your trigeminal nerve. Help me remember. Okay, now, Next, uh, vestibular cochlear is not, well, okay, wait, 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 that was trigeminal. Trigeminal, both, it's mixed. It has motor output to the face 
and sensory input from the face. General sensory input from the face. Abducens, motor to the eye. Facial is mixed. So it's got both sensory and motor. The motor output is going to the muscles of facial expression. Motor to face. The sensory part though is coming from your tongue. So it's actually bringing in special sensory information for your sense of gustation. So your taste buds are hooked up to two different cranial nerves. The anterior two thirds of your tongue, those taste buds are hooked up to your facial nerve. So for facial nerve, we could say that it's bringing in sensory information about taste from the anterior two thirds of your tongue. Sensory, taste, anterior two thirds of tongue. Why do we care? Well, because it's different than the posterior one third of your tongue, which is hooking up to glossopharyngeal. We'll get there in a minute. But what might help you remember is that anterior is front and the facial nerve is controlling the or responding to sensations from the front of your tongue. But like AMP wise, it's anterior. All right. Vestibulocochlear, this is a sensory neuron. Vestibule, cochlea, these are in your inner ear. The vestibule is paying attention to your place in space or where your head is. And the cochlea is paying attention to the sound waves that are being funneled into your ear. So your vestibulocochlear nerve is bringing in sensory information from your ear about your balance, your head position, and about audition or auditory information that is coming in. So this is sensory for the ear and we'll just say for balance and hearing. Okay, glossopharyngeal, both. It's a mixed nerve carrying motor information to the muscles of your pharynx. Your pharynx is a muscular funnel that conducts air from your nasal cavity into your respiratory system and conducts food from your oral cavity into your digestive system. So there are muscles, if, you're sw if you need to force swallowing, there are muscles in your pharynx that can do that. So that's the motor part. So we'll say motor output to the pharynx or muscles of the pharynx. And sensory input. This is coming from the posterior one third of your Hmm. Taste information from the posterior one third of your tongue. Okay, so all of the sensations of taste that you're receiving when you're eating a meal and tasting that, all of those sensations are being conducted through those two cranial nerves. If you're vomiting and taste it, the vagus is going to be involved. But when we're bringing food and liquids into our mouth and tasting that, our facial and glossopharyngeal nerves are the ones that are conducting that information to our uh, gustatory cortex, which was where? The insula. All right. Vegas. I love Vegas. It's also called the wanderer. Vegas. Roman numeral number 10. So if I have to remember, well, which is like, which is the, is it, is it velvet? Is it very? Vegas is velvet. And it's cool. It's vagus is your largest cranial nerve. It's the only one that exits the head and wanders. It wanders all the way to your viscera. It goes through your diaphragm. It's amazing. This is going to be what's bringing out the commands for the parasympathetic division of our nervous system. And so we'll talk a lot about, a lot about it. Um, it's both, it's mixed. It's bringing in sensory input from your viscera and it's sending out motor output to your viscera for the parasympathetic division. And then also actually, if you vomit, there are taste buds on your epiglottis or like at the, yeah, the superior aspect back there that are hooked up to your vagus so that you can taste the vomit. Kind of, I don't know, interesting. So uh, we'll talk about that when we get to special senses. I, I bring that up now because when we get to the sense of taste and all of a sudden vagus nerves appears, if I didn't bring it up, you're gonna be like, wait, I thought taste was only these two. It's not, vagus can taste vomiting. <laughs> Vegas vomit, okay, done. So both, we've got motor and sensory to the viscera, we'll say. Oh, Vegas, viscera, vomit, all of it, love it. 
lots of V's that I, I just realized that. Oh, look, there's a V and an upside down V. We got it. Rigus. All right, the next nerve is the accessory nerve. This used to be called the spinal accessory nerve. And that's because our spinal nerves are controlling the movement of our limbs and all that stuff. And the accessory nerve actually innervates your trapezius, which is this massive muscle that controls movements of your neck and upper shoulders. So it used to be called the spinal accessory. We're just going to call it accessory for ah before the ha. Huh! And we'll say that this uh, is going to give motor output to muscles in the neck and shoulders. So accessory, motor to muscles of neck and shoulders. Okay. And I actually want to take a brain break for a moment right here and tell you a little story because it's going to bring lots of stuff together. So, and it's about like something relevant. I am a CNA. I've been a CNA for a million years now. And when I was young and first got my CNA license, I started working with a woman who's a quadriplegic. And she... <sighs> had all of this spinal damage at like C7, C8, so her cervical spinal nerves. So she can't really do anything from her neck down. But because she didn't damage the accessory nerve, she is able to use her shoulders in a way. She is the most functional quadriplegic person I've ever met. She's got these braces for her hands. She calls them the Cadillac of braces or somebody else told her they were the Cadillac. She's got the best. And so because her accessory nerve is able to work and move her trapezius and she's got this great brace, she's able to actually be super functional. She's one of the most fashionable, like beautiful, like hair, makeup, everything women I've ever seen. She does graphic design for a, like for a profession and for her church. And it's all because that spinal accessory nerve wasn't damaged. How does this relate to what we've talked about before? One of the things that I didn't mention when we were talking about spinal nerves is that when we look outside the spinal cord, you can see this different differentiation of our information, right? So back here is sensory information, right here is motor information. So if I damage a nerve out here, I'm gonna damage everything and I'm not gonna be able to feel and I'm not gonna be able to move. But if all I do is damage, let's say my ventral root, then I can feel, but I can't move. Or if all I do is say damage my uh, dorsal root, then I can move, but I can't feel. And so I had kind of wanted to tell you that when we were talking about the spinal cord. We'll talk more about spinal nerves next, um, but that's just something to be uh, aware of. And my quadriplegic patient, she had damage all the way through so that she can't feel or move. But she's got a friend who has damage only through his ventral roots. So he's quadriplegic. He can't move anything, but he didn't have any damage in his dorsal roots so he can feel everything. And yeah, I mean, and that's a sensation perception thing. So his, so her, my, my quadriplegic patient with full damage, her receptors, let's say like pressure receptors in her gluteal region when she's sitting all day, those receptors are feeling the pressure. Those nociceptors are feeling the pain. The sensations are happening, uh, but the sensations only go to here. So since they don't go up any higher, she doesn't have perception of those sensations. Her friend, his sensations are making it all the way to his brain. So he perceives the pain and the pressure of sitting and not being able to move all day. But he can't move, so he can't do anything about it. All right. Crazy stuff. The last of our nerves is the hypoglossal below the tongue and it's motor and it puts motor output to the muscles of the tongue. So all this tongue flapping I'm doing right now is because I'm activating my hypoglossal nerve. So this is motor to the tongue, motor to the muscles of the tongue. And those are the cranial nerves. All right, so all of our spinal nerves are mixed meaning that they contain both sensory and motor neurons. So our spinal nerves are named or numbered for the portion of the spinal cord uh, from which they are arising. And you'll see we've got eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar spinal nerves, five sacral spinal nerves, and one little coccygeal spinal nerve. So 
our cranial nerves were big C, big N, and then their numerals. We could also, like our vertebra, could be like, like your cervical vertebrae are C1 through C7, and your cervical nerves <coughs> are C sub 1 through C sub 8. So this is how we designate our cranial nerves. This is how we designate our vertebrae. And this is how we designate our spinal nerves is with the little sub. So like our, our thoracic vertebrae were T big one through T big 12. But now our thoracic spinal nerves are T sub one, T sub 12. Okay, you say, well lady, we've got seven cervical vertebrae. Why do we have eight cervical spinal nerves? And the reason is because C1 comes out on top of C1, C2 comes out below C2, and then every other one comes out below its vertebrae. Okay, so that's why we have one more cervical ne spinal nerve than cervical vertebra. Um, and yeah, that's that. So they are all mixed. <clears throat> spinal nerves are all mixed. Um, our cervical nerves are going to branch out and help to serve the arm. Our thoracic nerves are going to contain visceral uh, um, <clears throat> neurons as well. Our lumbar nerves are going to have some things that go out to serve the lower limbs, well, and sacral nerves too. Uh, and then our sacral and coccygeal are really in control of like the visceral organs and reproductive organs and all of that jazz. All right. So <clears throat> just be aware of that. Uh, know how many spinal nerves you have and f how many are arising from which part of the spinal cord. How many pairs is this? Well, 8 plus 12 is 20, plus 10 is 30, plus 1 is 31. You have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Okay. Cool. Spinal nerves. Each spinal nerve is connected to the spinal cord via these two roots. And we just talked about them a little bit ago. Um, we've talked about them a couple times. The ventral roots contain only motor information or contain only motor neurons coming into the spinal cord. And then our dorsal roots, or I guess I should say coming out of the spinal cord. And <clears throat> Our dorsal roots contain only sensory neurons coming into the spinal cord. Okay. So those two roots are going to come together to form the spinal nerve. So here's the ventral root. Here's the dorsal root. They come together and form one mixed spinal nerve. Okay. Here's the ventral root, here's the dorsal root, comes together to form a spinal nerve. All right, cool. Now, nerve plexes. One is a nerve plexus, multiple are nerve plexes, and these are these fancy kind of conglomerations of the branching of nerves that come out and like mix together and rearrange in weird ways to serve different parts of the body. If you take a neurophysiology class, you can go into great detail about which nerves, cranial, um, not cranial, cervical, uh, thoracic, lumbar, sacral nerves are all coming together to form each of these nerve plexes. But this is not neurophysiology, this is anatomy and physiology, so we're just gonna cover the basics so that you know that the cervical plexus is going to be this kind of mixed arrangement of nerves that come together and serve the muscle of your head and neck and kind of upper shoulders. And then your brachial plexus is going to be this kind of combination of nerves that come together and go out and serve the arm. And then your lumbar plexus is this combination of spinal nerves that come together and serve your legs. So 
nerve plexes occur when our various spinal nerves come out and branch and kind of reconnect in different ways to serve different parts of the body. Your cervical plexus serves your neck and superior shoulders. Your brachial plexus is going to branch and then after all of these nerves come together, it's going to branch into the name nerves that serve your various arm, like your radial ulnar nerve, all of that. So that's, oh, those are all coming out of the brachial plexus. So this serves the arm and forearm or your upper limb. Now your next two, some books actually combine them as the lumbosacral plexus. And that's because the way that these nerves branch together really, I mean, it's kind of tricky <laughs> to separate them. The, the neurons mix and blend in really interesting ways here to serve the lower limb. The lumbar plexus, if you look at it and just wanted to totally separate it out on its own, it really has more of the branches that serve the anterior part of the thigh, definitely the upper, like your thigh, and then the anterior part of the leg. And then the sacral plexus has the branches that are going to serve more posterior and inferior. <clears throat> The sacral plexus contains the largest nerve in your body, your sciatic nerve, that runs all the way down your leg and has branches that serve all the way to your big toe. So really it's kind of hard to split these apart, but if we wanted to, we could say the lumbar plexus is more serving the thigh uh, and anterior lower limb. And then our sacral plexus is going to serve the thigh and posterior lower limb. Um, so really they're like, it's, it's hard to separate, but if we wanted to pick, we could say this is serving, um, it serves the leg and posterior lower limb. The other thing that we could say if we're splitting them totally apart is that the sacral plexus contains the sciatic nerve, which is the largest nerve in your body. So contains your sciatic nerve. This is our largest nerve. And it's got branches that serve all the way to your big toe. All right, the peripheral nervous system contains A, the brain, B, the spinal cord, C, the cranial nerves, D, all of the above. Yeah, you're right, it's C, the cranial nerves, the brain and the spinal cord are in the central nervous system. Okay, the following are mixed nerves. All right, all of the above. Yeah, if you're a thoracic or a lumbar nerve, you're a spinal nerve. All of our spinal nerves are mixed nerves. Cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal, which is mixed. All right, <clears throat> we're almost done. Take a break if you need it. All right, part three. Motor endings and motor activity. Really, this is where our peripheral nervous system is going to shoot out these motor neurons that have a motor ending, and we're sending out these efferent commands to an effector. What are the effectors of <clears throat> our motor division? Some type of muscle or gland, right? So we've got skeletal muscle, we've got cardiac muscle, We've got smooth muscle, and we have glands. So for motor endings and motor activity, we have an entire chapter that's gonna talk about what happens in skeletal muscle, and we'll talk about what happens when our lower, no <coughs> our lower motor neuron synapses onto that skeletal muscle when we get to chapter nine. Cardiac muscle is found next semester in your chapter that covers the heart, and smooth muscle is found next semester in every chapter with every organ that's not in the heart. So I don't want to talk about motor endings and motor activity right now, like in nitty gritty detail. We just have to be aware that as part of the peripheral nervous system, we do have motor neurons that are synapsing onto our effectors to bring out the commands from our central nervous system. So 
Let's just have a quick <coughs> overview of that then. In our peripheral motor endings, these are the peripheral nervous system elements that activate our effectors. If they're neurons, then they're going to activate our effectors by releasing neurotransmitters, <coughs> which must mean that our effectors have neurotransmitter receptors. These are going to innervate skeletal muscle, visceral muscle, and glands. <laughs> so that's what we'll say for now. <laughs> Reflex activity. This is probably some of the more complex physiology you're going to need to know for the exam. So reflexes, we'll talk about general reflexes because there are visceral reflexes that you are completely unaware of. And then there are spinal reflexes that we're going to talk a lot about today. So be aware of that. We're going to first go over some like generalities of reflexes. But then we're going to get into specific spinal reflexes, which are the ones you're aware of. Next semester, when I talk to you about like an autonomic reflex, say if we increase heart rate, these components are still there. It's going to play out a little differently in our motor neurons, but just be aware that reflex arcs can be occurring either with your awareness or below your awareness, and we'll cover them all as we need to. So reflexes are protective things that happen to protect you, so you don't even have to think about them. Reflex activity, you are born with some reflexes, and then we learn some reflexes. The point of a reflex is that it is going to be executed without your cerebrum being involved at all. And that's why we can learn some, um, why we're born with some. So reflexes, are, they tend to be protective. And what we could say about them is they do not require the cerebrum. What does that mean? That they're handled by some lower brain region, division, or from the spinal cord. So inborn reflexes or intrinsic reflexes are things that everybody is born with. So the pupillary light reflex, if I shine a light into my eyeball real quick, then my pupil is going to constrict. That's an inborn reflex that protects your eye from too many photons of light hitting it. A learned reflex is something that you acquire through training. So what does this mean? That you repeat a behavior so many times that you don't really have to think about it to do it. What are some examples of learned or acquired reflexes? Driving uh, is an acquired reflex. So I'm sure that we've all had those moments where you've driven for like half an hour, 45 minutes, and like you arrive at your destination and you're just like, wait, how did I get here? You are so absorbed in your thoughts, I don't know about like the world falling apart in 2020 or whatever it is, that you completely checked out of driving. And you were able to do that because you've driven so many times that you have downloaded the program of motor commands for driving to your spinal cord. So you've learned or acquired that reflex. Driving becomes a reflex and you can do it without thinking about it because you've done it so many times. <clears throat> Driving a stick shift in particular, like that's the thing, like people who drive stick shifts and like all of a sudden wind up at a destination are like even more magnificent. To drive a stick shift, you have to be coordinating your hand and your foot and all of these things. But you can do that. You could drive for hours in a stick shift without thinking about driving. You could be contemplating the universe and you're able to do it. You're, you're able to contemplate the universe in your cerebrum because your spinal cord is handling driving. So another example would be like playing a song that you've played 10,000 times. You don't even have to think about the, the strings anymore or the movement of your fingers so that you've downloaded the program for that song by how much you've played it. So <clears throat> learned or acquired reflexes, we could say you, uh, with practice, you can learn behaviors that can be carried out through the spinal cord without any cerebral input. Okay, 
So these aren't necessarily protective per se. These sure are. The ones you're born with are protecting you for some, from something, for sure. So just as in homeostatic control mechanisms, we had components that were going to behave a certain way, in reflex arcs, we have components that are going to behave a certain way. And in our reflex arcs, we have a receptor that is going to detect a change or detects our stimulus. And it is going to communicate that information to a sensory neuron. So our sensory neuron is going to take the information from our receptor to the central nervous system, the brain or the spinal cord. And now our central nervous system is going to have our integration center that's going to decide what we're going to do. So this integration center could be mono or one synapse, monosynaptic, or polysynaptic, having more than one synapse. Okay, so what, what do I mean? Well, let's say we've got some receptor here and here's our sensory neuron, unipolar sensory neuron, synapsing right onto our motor neuron. Then that integration center here has one synapse. That's a monosynaptic integration center. Whereas I might instead have a synapse that's going on to an inner neuron that's then going on to a motor neuron. That integration synapse, uh, <coughs> that integration synapse, <sighs> that integration center has one, two, more than one, so it's polysynaptic, okay? Now the motor neuron is gonna respond to this efferent or this command and execute an efferent message to my effector. So my motor neuron is going to carry an impulse to the effector and that's coming from my integration center. So what's my integration center doing? It's responding to my sensory neuron and telling either another inner neuron or my motor neuron, ultimately my motor neuron, what to do. What am I gonna do in my motor neuron? I'm gonna fire an action potential that's going to be conducted to an effector and this effector is going to bring about my change to bring me back to normal <clears throat> or move me back to homeostasis. If I'm protecting, then I need to come back to the state where I'm okay. All right, so what are our specific spinal reflexes we're gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about four spinal reflexes. All right, so our spinal reflexes are protecting us from something. The first is called the stretch reflex, and this is protecting us from overstretch of a muscle. So if a muscle is experiencing dangerous levels of stretch, we have to be able to combat that. So, what the reflex is going to do is cause the opposite. So if your muscle is dangerously lengthening, what can we do to that muscle to combat that? We can make it contract, right? So that's what's going to happen at the end. Well, how do we do that? So for a stretch reflex, the stimulus is an increased level of muscle stretch. So we get increased muscle stretch, and this is going to be dangerous to the muscle. This is going to be detected by that muscle spindle. So the receptor for muscle stretch is the muscle spindle. Okay, so here's our receptor. That is going to communicate this information to our sensory neuron, which is our first order neuron in our relay of information. It's a sensory neuron by functional classification. It's a unipolar neuron by structural classification. And now it's going to come and synapse in the central nervous system on our integration center. So here, what we need to do when we've overstretched this muscle, let's say it's the quadriceps femoris and the reflex that we're uh, doing is the patellar tendon reflex or the knee jerk reflex. What happens is you hit that patellar ligament or ligament and <clears throat> or the quadriceps femoris tendon and what that's going to do is trick these muscles to think they're being overstretched so if your quadriceps are being overstretched then we can contract them and shorten them and we do that we have the knee jerk <laughs> reflex or we extend the leg so 
that's what's kind of happening here. So let's imagine that what we're doing is we're overstretching, overstretching our quadriceps, the femoris, like what we do when we tap the um, quadriceps femoris tendon. It's tricking this out and making it think that we've overstretched our quadriceps femoris. Then a muscle spindle is going to detect that. And now we're going to synapse onto a lower motor neuron going to the quadriceps. So the effector now is going to be the quadriceps. And here's our lower motor neuron that is going to bring out this command. So one, our receptor is the muscle spindle. Two, our sensory neuron is the sensory neuron. Three, our integration centers here in the spinal cord. Four, our motor, lower motor neuron is bringing out a command to five, our effector, the quadriceps femoris. And now what I'm telling the quadriceps femoris is to contract. So they're going to contract and I'm going to send my leg. I just showed you my secret. You thought I was being all stylish, but really I'm teaching class in my yoga pants. <laughs> okay, so I extend my leg. I contract the quadriceps, so I shorten them. So when I contract, I shorten. <laughs> And that undoes what's happening here, which is dangerous lengthening. Okay, well, the thing that we haven't quite talked about yet, because we haven't talked about all the muscular system, is that whatever the antagonist is doing, there's a muscle on the opposite side of the joint that is doing something else. So in this case of getting the quadriceps to contract, that is a monosynaptic integration center. But there's also a polysynaptic integration center that occurs here when my sensory neuron synapses onto an interneuron that is going to synapse onto the lower motor neuron that's going to my hamstrings. So the lower motor neuron that's going to my hamstring muscles would be what's responding to that. It's just going to make sure that they don't contract. I'm going to inhibit my hamstrings so that while my quadriceps are contracting, my hamstrings are not. We call this reciprocal inhibition. Okay. So in a stretch reflex, the stimulus to get it going is a dangerous level of muscle stretch. How I can undo stretching too much is to contract. How I contract is to get a lower motor neuron to stimulate that. All right, well, how am I going to do that? My muscle spindle is going to detect dangerous levels of stretch. Tell my sensory neuron, which is my first order neuron, which is going to synapse right onto my motor neuron in a monosynaptic integration center to cause that lower motor neuron to stimulate my quadriceps femoris to contract so that I combat this dangerous level of stretch. In a polysynaptic integration center, this sensory neuron is going to synapse onto an inner neuron that's synapsing onto my lower motor neuron to my antagonist muscle, and I will have reciprocal inhibition. So that while this muscle is contracting, this one is not, and now I can make sure that I protect this muscle from too much stretch. Now what if the opposite is occurring? Would what is going to happen when my muscle is shortening too much or I'm generating dangerous levels of tension? In that case, my tendon is going to stretch and activate a tendon reflex. So we'll say a tendon reflex is activated in response to dangerous levels of muscle tension. What does this mean? Well, as a muscle is doing more and more work, it's shortening and shortening and shortening. And if I ask it to do like dangerous levels of work, I'm going to start pulling on this tendon and potentially pop the muscle off the bone. So the tendon reflex is activated to make sure that I will drop the load and protect my muscles. So the stimulus is going to be an increase in stretch of the tendon. So an increase in stretch of the tendon is the stimulus. And we increase the stretch of our tendon when we increase the shortening of the muscle. And I increase the shortening of the muscle when I increase tension. Okay, so that's the stimulus. And that's going to be detected by the receptor, which is who? The tendon organ. 
And now, this is my receptor, is gonna tell my sensory neuron, and they're all polysynaptic from here on out, and I don't care about the nitty gritty details of how many inner neurons there are. Just know they're all polysynaptic from here on out. So, one of these uh, terminals from this sensory neuron is going to synapse onto an inner neuron that is synapsing onto a lower motor neuron that is going to this muscle, the lower motor neuron that's causing this muscle to contract too much. And now my lower motor neuron is gonna be inhibited and I will drop the load. So this is my muscle with too much tension. And the lower motor neuron is going to inhibit it. I'm going to relax and I drop the load. Okay, so my inter integration center is polysynaptic. I've got an inner neuron who's synapsing onto my lower motor neuron to the muscle that's experiencing too much tension. I inhibit that lower motor neuron, the muscle relaxes and I drop the load. Well, let's imagine that the biceps brachii is the muscle that has too much tension. The muscle opposite that is my triceps brachii and now while this is relaxing, this one is gonna need to contract or experience reciprocal activation. So the other thing that's going to happen here is I, at a, in another polysynaptic integration center, I'll synapse onto an inner neuron that is going to synapse onto my lower motor neuron to my antagonist and that is going to contract. So if the muscle with too much tension, let's say, was the biceps brachii, I'll cause that to relax on this side of the reflex, but now to my triceps brachii, they will experience reciprocal activation. And they will contract. And that's because the lower motor neuron is stimulating them. All right, that is the tendon reflex. We only have two more spinal reflexes and this guy just woke up. I think we can get through them <laughs> and call it good for the day. So the next two reflexes are the flexor reflex and the cross extensor reflex and they tend to come paired in the body. What do I mean, come paired? That when you get a flexor reflex, most often you're also going to get a cross extensor reflex. 100% of the time if these reflexes are happening in the leg. Not all the time if these reflexes are happening in the arm. So let's go over that in just a minute. So our last two spinal reflexes are the flexor and cross extensor reflex. The flexor reflex is sometimes called the withdrawal reflex. And what happens in a withdrawal reflex is you have some kind of painful stimulus that you withdraw from. So you touch a hot plate or you step on a tack and it hurts. So whatever's hurting is definitely gonna flex away. If you're in your leg, you're definitely gonna cross extend your other leg to bear the weight of the leg that just flexed away. Now if you touch a hot plate, and you pull away from it on the left, you're not necessarily going to cross extend on the right arm, but you might. In some cases where let's say the stimulus they say for this is noxious, so it's something unpleasant like pain, or in your arm a noxious or unpleasant stimulus that might cause you to flex and cross extend would be say you're walking down a dark alley at night and somebody grabs your wrist. So they grab your wrist, you are gonna flex that grabbed wrist away and hopefully in that case you will cross extend and you'll deck them in the face, okay? So <laughs> what we could say is the stimulus is we're gonna do the flexor reflex in pink and then we'll do the cross extensor reflex in blue. And so for the flexor reflex, the stimulus is gonna be something noxious. So noxious, what does that mean? Unpleasant. So it could be pain or in the case of somebody grabbing your wrist, fear. Uh, it's unpleasant. So the, the receptor is going to be different. For pain, what kind of receptor would it be? A nociceptor. For fear, <laughs> we're not even going down that path, but actually physically in your skin you would be activating mechanoreceptors. Either way, we're going to tell our receptor and the receptor is going to tell our sensory neuron 
and our sensory neuron is going to uh, synapse onto our interneurons in the integration center. And what's going to happen? Well, <clears throat> The, the muscle or in the limb that's experiencing this noxious stimulus, let's say pain, and it's a nociceptor, and it's in your arm. What muscles are flexors in your arm? Or what have you learned? The biceps brachii, right? The muscles in the anterior compartment of your arm are flexors. The muscles in the posterior compartment of your arm are extensors. So if I'm flexing away in my arm, then the effectors down here are gonna be my flexors. My sensory neuron is gonna synapse onto my inner neuron. That's gonna synapse on my lower motor neuron to my flexors, and I'm going to stimulate them to contract, and I will flex away. So this is my sensory neuron, this is my integration center in the spinal cord, this is my lower motor neuron to the flexors, which is going to stimulate my flexors to flex away. Okay, well then what do we think I'm going to do to the extensors in this limb? I'm going to inhibit them, right? They will experience reciprocal inhibition. So my lower motor neuron to the extensors in this limb are going to be inhibited so that these will relax while I contract these. All right, my flexor reflex took up my entire board. That was unanticipated. The sensory neuron is also going to synapse onto interneurons that are going to cross over the spinal cord and cause this crossed extensor reflex. So let me erase this and we'll look at that. Okay. So I have flexed away from the noxious stimulus on one side and I'm going to cross the spinal cord to have the cross extensor reflex on the other side. So let's imagine that I stepped out to tack with my right leg. Then a nociceptor is going to feel that and tell my sensory neuron that is going to synapse onto my multipolar uh, inner neuron in my spinal cord, my multi uh, polysynaptic integration center and one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to stimulate my flexors which in my leg are what? The hamstrings and I'm going to inhibit my extensors which are what? The quadriceps, okay, quadriceps femoris, good. That's what's happening on the left side of my body where I'm flexing away from the um, painful or noxious stimulus. All right, now, in order to not fall over when I flex away on the left side, I have to cross my spinal cord and extend my right leg. So in order to do that, it's the same sensory neuron, but it's synapsing onto this inner neuron that's giving us this polysynaptic integration center here in the spinal cord. And on one side, on the epsilateral side, I'm controlling the flexor reflex. On the contralateral side, I'm controlling the crossed extensor reflex. Flex. So now this inner neuron is going to synapse onto lower motor neurons serving my flexors and extensors in my right leg. And what if, which muscles am I going to stimulate in my right leg? The extensors. So now this will be the lower motor neuron to my quadriceps and they will be stimulated to contract and my right leg is going to extend. So then my lower motor neuron to my flexors, which are what? The hamstrings is going to inhibit them so they experience a reciprocal inhibition. So they relax while my quadriceps contract and I can extend to support my weight as I have flexed away on the left side. So that wraps up everything from chapter 13, I will see you in the Teachers Helping Students Succeed discussion board. <laughs> and what did you see in the background? Pause. Well, nothing, and if they ever ask, I'll deny it all. So, I don't have an eraser. Hey, caramba.